Hello and welcome to Live from America podcast. Uh, this is Hatem alongside me, Noam Dorman, one of the Hello. comedy seller. Good to see you. See you. And he's live from the olive tree, from the comedian, the legendary comedian stable. So yes, many I shows, am. so many movies been done about this table right there. Huh. And uh, Andrew Heaton, comedian and friend, and happy birthday. You just turned uh, 29. I turned 40, but I look probably 47. So I'm just what, what I want everybody to do is if you're younger than me, do some real heavy drinking and smoking and catch up with me. My my goal is to eventually have everybody look about what age I look, which is, I think, 45. And I think I sound about 52. People are really surprised when they meet me that I'm I'm not like some elder Garrison Keeler character. Well, you look good, man. Thank you. <laughs> and our guest of honors uh, are Matt and Tony Browning. Hello, guys. Welcome. Hi, so glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, so Matt is an internationally recognized authority on the inner workings of white supremacy groups. He was an undercover detective for more than two decades in Arizona, gaining intimate uh, vantage point to the KKK, Skinheads, uh, Brad Poise, uh, all the other uh, white power groups. Uh, and he's here. I'm here. <laughs> and Tani, she's a mother of five. That's, that's the hardest one, you know. Uh, and she was also uh, the supervising and casting producer for A&E's Escaping Polygamy. Welcome to and the I show. And she's yes, uh, she's been assisting for... uh, with the investigation. Actually, she's almost in uh, was undercover as well. Thank you for being here. Yeah, we're glad to be here. I got to plug this real quick. But we did start Secrets of Polygamy. Um, we're into we've we've already aired two um, episodes of a ten episode series. So that just started a couple weeks ago. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. All right. Well, so you can find us on A and E. That's that's an interesting and their book, which we're going to discuss here today, is uh, uh, the Hate Next Door undercover within the uh, new faces of white supremacy. So, what a story that you guys have. Uh, so, you were undercover for a long time. How did this whole thing started? How did you gain this access? I mean, you're embedded for a long time to the right. these extremist group. We want to learn everything that we can about them and all that. But how did the whole thing started? Uh, one night, a, a skinhead tried to kill me. He stuck a gun in my stomach and in my chest, and he tried to shoot me. So we ended up fighting over the gun. And and when somebody tries to kill you, it, it makes you want to understand what they're about and what they're thinking. And that started this whole long road that we call life. It, it became really personal. Yeah. So why would they want it to kill you? I understand they want to kill me, but why? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? It, it was an authority thing. I wasn't undercover at the time. I was working gangs. and. One of our motor officers tried to pull this guy over and he ran and I ran after him and caught him on the side of a house and he pulled a gun, hit me in the chest and we ended up fighting. Mm. And, and that's what happened. It was it was an authority thing. You know, a lot of white supremacists, they don't like the government anyways. And so it was one of those things. And, you know, luckily for me, he went to jail. I went home and it started this road that I'm on. You know, but you got to let him know. What, what was it? Three weeks later, he did. He shot a cop. Yeah, two weeks later, he shot a cop in the back. So he, oh, had, wow. he had he had some type of wish. He wanted to shoot a cop. So, you know, that's how it started. So you you decided I'm going to go undercover and I'm going to, ex, you know, expose this world and understand it and, and all that, right? Yeah, I, I decided after that happened that something needed to be done. I started doing my research on different groups who was in, in my jurisdiction in Arizona and, you know, a lot of it was going underground. Nobody was doing anything with it because for whatever reason, they're concentrating on Hispanic and black gangs. And so I started looking at the white boys. And next thing you know, I'm sitting at a Denny's having a meeting with with uh, the Arizona president of the National Union. So they have ranks and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it depends on the group. When when I was with the Klan, they wanted me to, me to be the night hawk. And so that was the head of security. You know, the nations, they they call people their captains, lieutenants. Um, they have arms. sergeant at arms. They have the vice president on down. Oh, interesting. So before you start being like, uh, and, and then I'll let anybody else ask questions because, I, you know, there's, it's a very interesting story. When you made the decision, I'm going to go undercover. Obviously, Tanya, what was your reaction? Because you also going to go undercover, right? Well, I mean... Really, I can't. I want to be a country singer. I mean, I I love Disneyland and I love. Are you a musician? And, uh, yeah, I love flowers and unicorns and all of you know all the fun stuff. So to me, he was kind of our protector. I was never okay. You know, I never really. It, it didn't hit me what he was about to do and what was 
you know, the trajectory our life was about to take. Um, I, I just knew he was good at his job and he saw evil somewhere and that's what he was there to do. As far as I was concerned was to fight evil. And, um, I wanted to support him any way I could do that. I didn't have any idea what that really meant at the time. Hmm. Wow. Uh, I, I've got a question. Um, uh, you know, right now I, I work in political media and there's a tendency to, um, use the term white supremacist very broadly and and to assume that um, dog whistling is intended specifically for Nazis or something like that. Uh, I'm curious in terms of what you would qualify as real white supremacists, how many do you think there are in the country and and how do you define them? Well, I define white supremacy as anybody that because you're white, you're the only true race, the only true religion. Um, white power, meaning that the white race it will dominate everybody else, regardless of of your stature in life. That's that's my definition of white supremacy. I mean, the word supremacy itself tells you that the white guys think that they're supreme to anything else. Now, you got to remember, there's black supremacists, there's Mexican supremacists. Every organization has their own supremacist group. Um around the you know, around the globe, around the, the, the country, I have no idea. That's what, you know, the book's titled The Hate Next Door because what we found out in our journey through this white supremacy world is next thing you know, I'm down on the border, you know, working with militia groups or I'm in schools trying to talk to junior high kids and, and get them out of an organization that their uncle or father tried to get them into. So, you know, they're all around us and it just goes underground and unchecked. And, you know, what the problem is, is when they take their... We we developed a, a, a an algebraic equation to solve white supremacy. You have an ideology, and then you add the rhetoric that comes from the ideology. You multiply that by a little bit of religion, and it equals violence. So if you want to take out the violence, you have to take out these three things. And you know, I learned the ideology. I listened to the rhetoric. And I learned that religion is a main focal point in a lot of these guys. And so our goal is to stop the violence. What do you, oh, what do you think the appeal is? It's just like any other gang, I would say. You got your brotherhood. You have your um, acceptance. A lot of guys were beat up as kids by Hispanic or black, so they learned to hate them. It's going down the rabbit hole of Jews control the world and Jews control the media. Uh, no, they, it's, they don't? <laughs> no. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of them and none of them do. Um, you know, it's it depending on what part of the country you live in. We live in Arizona. So a, a big push in Arizona is the anti-immigration, which, which is which, happening all over the United which, States. Yeah, now. Exactly. It's everywhere now. But when you ever you can be anti-immigration, that's fine. But when you go down to the border specifically to hunt and hurt illegal immigrants, regardless of their race, um, that's where it crosses that line. And I think we all know that's not okay. No matter where we, wherever we lean, lean politically, it's not okay to hurt somebody else because of their color or their belief systems. Yeah, believe what you want, just don't hurt somebody. You know, when I when I I just was so shocked that this was even going on in America. Way you know the whole thing. They would tell me if you if you're not white, you ain't right. And so, and I was very accepted very fast because I am pretty white. And and blonde haired and it it just was shocking to me that someone would have pride in that instead of who they were as individuals or people. It's shocking. It still shocks me. But to back to Andrew's question, like uh, to piggyback on it, like a lot of people are not white supremacists, but they now a lot of people are painting them with being white supremacists. Uh, for instance, give me a for instance, and I'll I'll tell you my opinion. Um, I mean, I, I, I hear a lot in the news. He's, he's this, he's this. So I don't know if it's like, I don't know names by. Right. Well, you got to look at it like this. Um, what is What's going to get you the most views? What's going to get you the most clicks, the links, everything else? There's guys running white supremacist groups or white nationalist groups that the only reason why they're doing it is for the money behind it. You know, you, you click and subscribe. I get money. So I'm going to keep promoting the rhetoric that, you know, it's okay to to uh, believe that we need to have a racial holy war in this country, or it's okay to believe that, you know, all the immigrants are going to come up and muddy up the race. It's okay to believe this stuff. And that's what they're pushing, you know, but if you look at it, it's not, okay. 
you can think it, you can believe it, but as soon as you cross that line of an overt act or an overt motivating somebody else to commit a crime because of your ideology and rhetoric, then there's a problem. You know, I hate that we're throwing that around so much because it really is a huge issue and a problem and we can't paint everybody with a white supremacist brush or, you know, anyone who's white. I mean, I have four white sons. I don't want them painted with that brush. Yeah. Um, and yeah I, I think don't that's... Social media is one of the things that people just, you know, call people stuff without even, you know, whatever. Just throw it around here. Right. If I call somebody a white supremacist, it's because I've done my research and I've done my and I know what I'm looking at. No. So, and that's what I mean. Like for you, when you're an expert and you like, you know, you, your life was in danger all these years for that. And you see somebody who just accusing whatever it must anger you because, you know, the real deal, you know, the danger of it. So, you, you know, what angers me more is to hear somebody say stuff about, um, you know, say something that is big in the rhetoric world of ideology of hate and, and now it becomes mainstream. There used to be things that people are saying things now on the media, in social media, whatever it is, that you would never hear or see unless you're on a specific white supremacy website. Mm -hmm. And now it's becoming commonplace. That's what's that's what's bothering me. That's what upsets me. Can I ask you a question? Is uh so who do you consider a uh, white is um Tucker Carlson a white supremacist? No, no, not that I haven't looked into Tucker, but I believe he Tucker Carlson has his beliefs, his views, his i i ideas. Um, he he might you know I haven't really looked into him. I don't. It's a great question. It, I don't. I don't. I've spent my time looking at the guys that have the swastika tattoos that are out there actively beating and killing and, and harming people. I think a lot of the media is just saying a lot of things because they want the viewership. I, I got to wonder how much do they really believe this or, or are they looking for votes or like Matt said, viewership? How much do they really buy into? The problem is whether or not they buy into it, there's a whole base of people that do, which is making this all mainstream. I'm not trying to say he isn't a white supremacist, but he did make that remark about that's not how white people fight. And uh, he has he has been caught out there saying right. certain things which white supremacists would probably uh, nod their head to. Uh, I I agree. I agree. He and, and I think a lot of that. I mean, let's just I mean, come on, let's call it for what it is. We have a, a, a political leader saying that the illegal immigration is going to muddy up the bloodline. That's I mean, straight up white supremacist. That's straight rhetoric. up white supremacist rhetoric. It came, Adolf Hitler said that. So you think Trump is a white supremacist? I think Trump. No, I think Trump wants the votes. I think Trump is trying to win an election. He's going to say and do whatever he has to do to get that extreme vote. He's already. He's already from his last election. He already brought in the far right extreme, and he lost. Now he's trying to bring in where else can I get more voters? And it's the extreme of the extreme is what he's going after. And I always think New uh, Trump is from New York. He knows what's going on. But he, like you said, he's trying to get the votes. He's not a, you know, he sees what sells and go for it, I think. That's what I think Trump's doing. I is, mean, is Trump, does he have nationalist views and philosophies? I'd have to sit down with him and, and hear what he has to say. But again, I don't want to label somebody that I haven't looked into. Yeah, I can just I can just listen to their rhetoric. But what they're saying, and what, what they're saying is frightening. Yeah, so I, I don't know about this. Trump said immigration is going to muddy up the bloodline. Mm -hmm. I never heard this. Trump Trump said you better get the right quote uh, here. I'll read it to you. It's right here. Yeah. And, and you know what? Is he Hitler? I, I hate that when people say that because he's not Hitler. There was one Hitler. But it's 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 disturbing <laughs> because words matter. He said they're poisoning the blood of the country of this country. Oh, okay, that's it. immigrants are poisoning the blood of this country. In Mein Kampf, Hitler says that you know the the immigration, the Jews and the immigrants are poisoning and muddying up the blood of the pure German. Yeah, but I, you think Trump uh, knew that that Hitler said that? Yes, you do. I okay. Do. I, I, oh. They say Trump never reads. All right. <laughs> well, someone, who, someone who advises him knew. I, I don't mean, know. I, I don't know. You just you you. I mean, come on. You can't really. Again, my opinion. You can't really pull this crap out of a hat. 
you know, he heard it somewhere. He read it somewhere. Somebody told well, him. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I find myself in a weird position here. I just don't want to jump to conclusions. Poisoning yeah. the blood is a pretty common yeah. metaphor, you know. I, I bet if I Googled it, I could find a thousand examples of people who have used that yeah. metaphor. But um, yeah, you maybe could, but the the met the the usage that I'm familiar with yeah. is from Mein Kampf. And, so. and I never read Mein Kampf. I never even knew it came from Hitler, but I can tell you how there's been at least um, yeah, yeah, yeah. when I first started learning about white supremacy at all, that's what the guys would tell me is muddying up the race, muddying up the blood, you know, that kind of thing. That's just straight straight from their playbook. What What is the overlap between... Uh, Capital W, capital S, white supremacists, you know, uh, bigots who are violent, mm -hmm. who also know like Hitlerian rhetoric. And I, I ask this because I, it wouldn't surprise me to find out that there are a lot of racists in the country, but I would I'm being classist here. I'm assuming they're not well read. Uh, and and so I'm, I'm curious what that Venn diagram looks like. Wow. You know, go ahead. And I, you know, one of the things that really shocked me is that when I got involved is that the first guy I really talked to at length could really speak the King's English. He was better read than me. His parents were, I don't want to say too much, but his parents were, one of them was an English professor at a college. So really? I thought that they would all be knuckle dragging, you know, back hills, can't string two words together type folks. And that just wasn't what we found. You, you okay. have to have somebody who can speak and motivate within the organization. Otherwise, they're just sitting around at barbecues, looking at each other, drinking beer, getting drunk. Somebody has to be able to, to, to teach and promote and educate these guys on the way that they, the things that they should be doing. And, and I remember thinking if I was a young girl who wasn't, you know, who didn't have this man sitting next to me, and if I didn't have the kind of upbringing that I did, could I have been influenced by this guy? And the answer, you know, it just it kind of threw me into a whole different space. That's a good question. What's the answer? Uh, you know, may I, well, I would talk to some girls that were in, I'm like, why are you in this? You know, I talked to them and they, they told me about, you know, I didn't know that so-and-so was into this until his shirt came off and he had the big Swazi on his back. They didn't even know they mm -hmm. already sucked in. They were already, you know, getting, you know, anyway, they were already involved with each other before she even knew what his po political beliefs really were. Right. But at the same time, Tony grew up in a neighborhood that was Hispanic, um, inclusive of all different types of, of races. And, and Tony probably in my estimation, I've known her quite some time and we've been, you know, we've had some in-depth conversations. Um, I shouldn't have a racist bone in her body. She she wants to promote love. She wants to promote kindness. She wants to promote the things in life that bring happiness and joy. When you're dealing with hate or when you're dealing with Nazis, these these are the people that promote violence, promote, you know, we need to get rid of a certain religion or a certain race or ethnicity. There's no love and happiness there. So no, Tani wouldn't be able to do that stuff. But that, I feel like the radicalization of people, like some people were like, okay, they already, you know, race and have hate and stuff. So, and some people are just being convinced. Like they can be great people. Yeah. I know a lot of good people that could be like convinced of stuff like that. I think it's a mindset as well. But I always have this question about being undercover because to be deep undercover, like they say legally, that you can no no crime could be committed when you're there, no crime committed in your presence. Yeah, yeah when yeah. you in your but, but yet you are you want to be embedded but deeply. Also. How does that work? Oh, yeah. That's, you know what I I I my undercover career was about gathering intelligence to stop things from happening, and then if something were to happen, then I would be able to give the intelligence to people to investigate it. And put the people in jail that were, you know, that were committed the crime. Some of the hardest, one of the hardest things I have to deal with is there's a couple murders that happen within the groups that I was a part of that I, I just, I wasn't there that night to stop the incident from happening. I wasn't persuasive enough to tell a guy that, you know, you really need to talk to me about this or you will be dead. And, you know, those are the things that are, I never had a crime committed in my presence because I stopped them before they got to that point. And I really wish if I could go back in time, there would be a couple more people living today that, you know, maybe I could have helped out. 
you know, how would you nightmares are kind of made of, you know, and that's that 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 really does weigh on him at those times when he couldn't. And I have to remind him, but this is what you did. So I feel like The Departed is a great movie for undercover kind of right. What do you think? Our story? The Departed, like being undercover. Oh, my gosh. The Departed is the best. Yeah, I feel like being undercover is like, you know, he was just going crazy. And it's like he's trying to uh, do both worlds. And like he feels guilty. And see, that that's that's the thing about undercover work that that showed a great perception of what undercover works like, because you're sitting there. You, you're I, I'm hanging out with a bunch of haters being indoctrinated in hate. And then I have to leave that undercover gig and go do a different undercover gig against the people that were talking that I'm supposed to hate. And, and so it's a big mind screw, but, but that's why I'm lucky. I had Tani, I'd come home and Tani would say, Hey, 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 Whoa, you know, turn this music off, relax, look around. Here's the kids. Here's a dog. Let's have a conversation and get this out because what you're dealing with isn't life. It's an extreme. Not everybody is a hater. Not everybody is a white supremacist. So you just. And we learned later from a, from a shrink, from a psychologist that that's called detoxing, but we didn't know. I just knew, I mean, I was young and I just knew I loved him and I didn't like who he was sometimes when he came home. So we went through detox sessions that we just didn't know what we were doing, but that's what that was. How do you go undercover? And, and what, what I mean is, uh, do you just like, is, is, is the KKK on meetups or some equivalent? And they say, we're going to be meeting at Jerry's steakhouse next Tuesday at three. If you're racist, come by and like you come <laughs> in and you're like, you know, I'm not a racist, but I'm curious. You can maybe sway me. Like, how do you like, I don't know. I, I feel like I am such a narc personality type. Like that if, if I, I can't ever buy drugs, it's impossible for me to buy drugs because I look like a narc. So like what like what do you do? How do you find them and how do you get in? Well, my first one was after I, after the guy tried to kill me and I started searching. I found that Arizona had a, a National Alliance chapter in Arizona. And so then I just reached I reached out to the guy. I said, hey, I'm interested in joining the organization. Tell me what's about. And he said, well, meet me at Denny's and we'll we'll have a conversation. So I go, all right. So I go to Denny's, get the old moons over my hammy, sit down with with a guy decked out in Swazi paraphernalia, a, a guy who had a, a chemical engineering degree and another guy, an old um, an old uh, World War II vet. And we're sitting there talking and I start developing my story to what they were saying. And so I would listen to them, ask them a question and then I say, okay, you guys, you guys hate Mexicans. So my my deal is going to be I hated Mexicans, and that's how I got in their good graces. And then from there on out, man, is you you get involved in the organization, you're already there. So the Hammers or or the Aryan Nations or the World Church, the Creator, you know, the the Boot Boys, whoever, you're already at one meeting, a monthly meeting that they have every month at at a hotel called La Quinta, and you're you're there you recognize your scene and you're in and then if you go to a barbecue you you know you better plan on that nobody's going to bring the meat because it's too expensive so it's going to be a barbecue of buns and that's all we had to eat we're the buns of hamburgers yeah but you learned to start bringing the beer and the, and mm -hmm. some of the hamburgers and that got him in as well yeah um, okay, I got a weird question. Um, I, I on my program, I interviewed a guy named Daryl Davis a few years ago. Uh, Daryl Davis is not an undercover guy. You're nodding, so I, I assume you're familiar with him. For for listeners that are unfamiliar with Daryl Davis, he's a black musician, and he uh, just makes friends with people in the clan, and then eventually they're like, "Daryl's one of my best friends," and they leave the clan. He's a wonderful human being, yeah, and it was it was fascinating talking to him because I I went, you know, what did you think about these people before you, before they converted and like came out of this? And he's like, I liked them. They had a horrible, odious worldview, but I liked them as people. So like it, when, when you're going undercover, are you suppressing contempt? Are you, are you seeing there's this good side of this person, but there's this dark side? Like how are, when, when you're interacting with them, what is your relationship with them like? And how are you interpreting these people? When you're sitting there re re reacting or when you're sitting there talking to them, you, you got to just play the role. And, and that's where the big mind screw comes in, because when you're when you're talking to a hardcore racist murder, I mean, I'm sitting there talking. To, I ended up locking these guys up for murder. When you're talking to these guys, they have to be your friends. 
you laugh at their jokes, you, you, you have conversations about whatever it is. And in any sign of hatred that you have for them or he, any sign of contempt, they will see and they will hit on. And then you can basically just cut off that whole conversation or that whole relationship with these people. So you really have to dive into, you, you kind of turn into this. But the more hate you deal with, your brain starts getting chemically rewired yeah. to That's becoming it. more like these people. You can understand more and you don't have the hatred for them. And so it was, I had a job to do, so I just did it. It was, was it hard? Yeah, because I don't hate blacks. I don't hate Mexicans. I don't hate Jews. But for that time, period of time in my life, I had to. Were, were there spillover effects where like, uh, I mean, I mean, like, are, are you using the same name at home with your wife? You know, your, your given name as you are when you're infiltrating. Is it a thing where like your Jewish neighbor's like, hey, man. I saw some shit you were saying on Facebook and you're like, <laughs> or like, are you, are you like putting on a fake mustache? Like, how does this work? No, that's, that's yeah. That's, that'd be funny if I put on a, a fake mustache and beard. No, dude, I had long hair in my ear pierce. I didn't shave my head. I, I didn't ha I don't have any tattoos on my body whatsoever. I, 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 my whole thing came from watching everything and talking about everything that I'm seeing with these people. You know, I, I dressed, I dressed the dress. I knew what I was talking about, but the secret of being undercover is not pretending like, you know, more than you really do. And I would go in and if I didn't know what they're talking about, I would say, dude, what the frick does that mean? I, I don't understand what you're saying. And when you ask that question to these people, they get excited because now they're the teacher and they get to educate the student and bring them up in the movement. And so I did a lot of that. And um, and that's exactly what I did, too. The more I didn't know, the more they wanted to teach me. And and quite honestly, we have friends and family that read the book and and they looked at me and said, I had no idea you're going through this. I have no idea that you were doing this. And and now everything is clicking together like, oh, I remember that. I oh, OK, that's why you were pissed off that day or or whatever it might be. Are you worried about reprisals now that this is this has come out and the organizations you presumably infiltrated can see who you really are? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I I got a couple of hits on me, but it is what it is. We've always I I can, as long as we as long as I can remember, we've had it, yeah. hits on us. I hit on hit on him, not never me. I mean, I've never. You, you and you know what's great about Daryl is that I I've never met him. I know who he is and I respect what he does is that he didn't back down. He walked full on 100% up to these people and said, here I am. Let's have a conversation. Kind of what you do. And that's exactly what I do. When somebody puts a hit on me, I walk up to him and say, I'm right here. What are we going to do about this? And, you know, in the back of my mind going, shoot, I hope they don't shoot me. Where you can. I mean, you know, there's a couple that you haven't been able to do that. But yeah, 90% yeah. of the time, that's exactly what he did. And so it's like it, it, it that and that's what we're missing in life is communication. People don't talk. So when we talk about hate, like how much hate is there really? Like they want to kill people or they just want to talk shit about them or they, they want to like how how bad was it? Or is it is it getting worse, too? Or is it like you think I mean, the that last I dealt that I dealt with? Yeah, I, that you're during seeing. My, yeah. During my time undercover, I put 19 haters in prison for murder or attempted murder and that's just here in the valley that's not what he helped do around the country that's mm. just right here that those were his cases i mean like charlottesville that was all based in 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 you know all that happened we could we could debate charlottesville for hours and hours and hours and but it was you know a bunch of haters there how much hate is here you know everybody I don't know. People hide behind hate. That's why you have keyboard Nazis now because they're afraid to do it. And then all of a sudden they're doing a, a mass shooting in San Diego or, you know, a shooting in Philadelphia or not in Pennsylvania. And, and so you know, how much hate is here? If you look, there's there's not everybody's a hater. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to live in peace. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to be successful. But there's that group of people out there that want to stop you, specifically you from being successful, from being happy. They, they believe that you don't deserve to be here because you're not white. And because of that, they will specifically target you. That's not right.
But is the, it every white person? I mean, that's where we're getting kind of, you know, now we've gone to this extreme of every white person is no. a white supremacist. And, you know, like I said, I have four boys. I don't want them labeled with that paintbrush. I don't want to be labeled with that paintbrush. So it's like, no, not everybody is a white supremacist, but it is out there. And we do need to keep it from creeping into our society the way that it has any more than it has. It's got to stop. Do you think that uh, Noam? I saw you raise your hand. Were you about to? Oh, ask I, I just wanted to say that I I I googled "poison the blood." It's it's not a common phrase. For some reason, I thought it was, or I'm not googling right. But yeah, it's I'm not glad a... that you did because I was yeah. like, I had never heard that until those guys started telling me, you know, a white girl like you, you know, you're the most precious thing that I our mean, world has, and if you brought in, if you slept with a black guy, then you know, you would just be throwing mud on a painting you know just yeah. things like that yeah. so when trump said that it was like what don't uh, say the that, bloodstream dude. into the bloodstream metaphor is common but poison in the blood is not is not as common like i thought it would be anyway go ahead that is like, they would tell yeah. me your ancestors for years and years and years have made this beautiful painting and now you're going to sleep with a, a black guy and have a black baby and you're just going to muddy the whole thing up you're going to poison we, it we yeah. had a murder in phoenix where uh, a white girl was walking with a black guy um, these two skinheads drive by, they see it, they go home, they get a shotgun, they come back, drive past them again, and they shoot the white girl. Now, the question is, is why are they shooting the white girl, not the black guy? I thought they were haters. I, I thought they hate the blacks. Well, the reason is, is because she was muddying up the race. She was poisoning, she was the, poisoning blood. the blood. the blood the, of the white oh, wow. woman. There, there is, there is an irony here that Liz Cheney said something about Trump, I think, uh, is a toxin in the bloodstream of America. But anyway. But see, yeah, that's that's <laughs> ironic. And you know what? The thing that's so crazy is we're just not political people. We never have been. It's just yeah. like it's like right is right, wrong is wrong. Here we go. And I just felt really sad when he said that. Yeah, we 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 just listen. It's like, holy crap, did you hear that? Yeah, it's just hard to hear. So. I, I I always wonder if like when you worked in your undercover, like when you work in the deep level, how the how the effect of a certain president could be because sometimes people are like, oh, he's going to make the country like this. or he's going to make the country. Did you feel any difference with the change of administrations or who's in charge or anything like that? Or those people are the same? Sure. Like when Obama became president, everybody thought the world was going to end because, oh, my gosh, we have a black president. Oh, they didn't vote for him? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so, you know, in the, in the in the white power world, the white nationalist world, what, whatever we want to call it, the hate world. You know, everybody was against it. Everybody was, you know, they're building compounds. They're going to come get us now. They're going to do whatever it is they're going to do. And then when when Trump became president, if if you notice when Trump became president, a lot of the extreme right came out of, for I lack know. of a better word, the extreme right came out of the wilderness into common um, common ground. And, and they were more proud to throw their flags. They were more proud to put up the signs. They were proud to, to wear the T-shirts and things like that. And now, because of what's going on in politics, now it's just everything has to keep going to the extreme. Extreme. Well, this extreme, we got it. We need to get the next extreme. So every... and. And these guys are looking for a leader. Anybody can stand up and be a leader. They're going to they're going to surround themselves with. And once that happens, once a true leader for the the extremist far right happens, then I think we're going to see a lot of changes, a lot of a lot of a lot of problems. In in terms of the to, to go back to the amount of people that are haters that are bigots, um uh, me being a not racist who's also pretty low testosterone, I'm just not exposed to any of these people on a regular basis. I'm, I'm, it's just not a part of my world. Whoa, if whoa, I, Andrew, you're low testosterone? Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you can't pick up on that, no. <laughs> I can, I can barely you, swing been, a hammer. You've been, you've been tested? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm functional, but, uh, you know, I just, I'm not very, you know, I, I'm not conflict averse, right? I am conflict averse. No, but, but I, I'm curious though, like, <laughs> Uh, a few years ago, what I, I let's say be, before everybody went nuts, you know, five, 10 years ago, whatever it was, I would have said that racism was on a pretty steep decline and had been. Uh, and now I, it's hard for me to tell is that the 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 kind of active violent bigotry, is that increasing 
Or is it this just that social media allows such people to be vocal in a way that we were previously unaware of? Or is it that they can all connect with each other and they're increasing? So is it a question of the public becoming more aware of what's going on or the phenomenon itself increasing? Well, I think, first of all, let's let's go back to what you said, the whole race. The testosterone thing? Well, it's, it's not that bad. You know what? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk off the air about okay, that. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> um, when, when it goes, we're not just talking racism. You know, the in, in the far the white supremacist world does not just hate people because of the color of their skin. Remember, they hate they hate you because you're Jewish. Some hate because of their Catholic. Some hate because of the Muslim or or whatever. Religion is huge in the world of hate. They hate people because they came up from Mexico. Yeah, so it's, they hate you because you have low tosto- testosterone and yeah. you're not man enough to like sh- and, to be a good you know, part of the male white race. I mean, and subjective to whatever they think that is. Which would be a proud boy because proud boys are extremely chauvinistic and they go out and they fight. They want to fight. But if you got low T, man, there's nothing you can do to help us out. Yeah, there's a a problem. There's a deficit in the bloodstream of Andrew Eaton. (laughs) Everybody here sounds like my ex-girlfriend. I, yep, I agree. (laughs) So I, I think what we're looking at now especially with the the war in Israel and Gaza and everything else, I think now the extremism has gone more to a, a hatred of, of religion. You know, the, the Jewish hate is coming out more. Um, and, 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 and as soon as that goes down, then we'll go, they'll go back. They're, they're still always going to hate the blacks. They're still always going to hate the Jews. It just depends on what's going on in the world that's going to bring out the more of the hate. But but here's a question. They get they in dilemma because they hate the Jews, then they get arrested. Which lawyer are they going to choose? The Jewish one, because they'll get <laughs> No, and it's it's so true. It, that's it's such hypocritical. And the another thing that I found so crazy is that they hated each other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they start murdering each other. And I'm like, well, everybody in this group is white and they have the same beliefs, and yet you'd find yourself, you know. They weren't your friend. Well, You'd I, find yourself dead. Imagine I'm this. Gonna... You, go go to, you, go, you go to a huge rally at a park where the Klan, the Aryan Nations, National Alliance, all these people are there. And so I'm there and I'm in the park and I'm watching, you know, I'm walking around talking to these guys. And, and because I'm who I am, I like to see what cars these guys show up in. They show up in a Honda, a Toyota. You know, there, there's no American made Chevys or Fords because, oh, they make the engines in Mexico. We can't drive those as you're driving a freaking Toyota. Mm. Well, so the, the hypocrisy in, in hate is just amazing. It, is it, it, opportunistic, it, hypocritical people. Is it possible in, in your mind or how do you see this to to uh, separate between people who want to live? Uh, uh, among their own kind and people who are supremacists. Yes. So how would you how would you distinguish those? Uh, you have a person that wants to be more sovereign and and live their own life away from anybody else, or they want to they have their commune with their own people. The difference is is they're not actively looking to hurt other people, and they're not actively trying to promote their hatred or their desire for another race or religion to be wiped off the earth. Um, people can live together all they want. I mean, separate from each other all they want. The difference is, is how bad you want to kill the person you're trying to stay away from. Yeah, I think that's a good answer, actually. I, I, you know, there was there was a stat that came out recently that threw me for a loop in terms of how to just address it. Where they, they, I think this is right, that more people came in last year uh, as immigrants, I think illegal immigrants, than were born. Oh, wow. uh, to, uh, they were born in America. I was like, you know, at some point, uh, you know, people who complain about this sort of thing, I'm not, I'm not ready to, to say that they're all a bunch of supremacists, you know, like uh, a country that has more people coming in illegally than it's actually uh, the sons and daughters of their own people. I, I get that, that that's a problem. You know, I get that. Yeah, you know, I, I and we talk about it in the book, The Hate Next Door, where I go toe to toe with a politician. And it's because he told me, you know, I don't know who you are, detective, but we don't need the thought police. And I and I thought, the thought police, they're taking their thought and putting it in action and they're killing people. That's the difference in all of this. If if I if if Tani wants to kill me and she says, man, I just I want to kill you. 
Is that a chargeable offense? No, it's not. If Tani goes out and gives a hitman $5,000 to kill me, that's an overt act and she can be arrested for that. That's the same thing we're talking about here. There has to be some type of, the crossover is violence. The crossover is, is the rhetoric and the ideology that equates to the violence. If you want to go live your life, go live it. Go, have, have more power to you. Don't hurt kids and don't don't go and promote violence. Uh, I my guess is that um, you've already indicated this is hypocritical. This this kind of worldview is hypocritical, and my I'm guessing not very logically consistent. So my guess is the answer to the following question is no. But I'm curious: um, is there a actual political agenda outside of race that people glom onto here? Like, are they really fired up about tariffs or about? Uh, I don't know, like top marginal tax rates, or is that is that just immaterial compared to let's invoke a race war? Nah, they're all about let's build a freaking wall, let's build the wall, build the wall, let's keep those dirty Mexicans out. All they're letting in is rapists and murders. We need to keep those out. The it's an invasion. Coming, it's an invasion. Yeah, I mean, we heard this long before it was politically mainstream. Yeah, well, I sat on the border in Arizona with a bunch of of militia guys trying to protect the border, keeping the the. I had one, and again, this is not my views and philosophies. This is what I was told. One guy said, we need to keep these guacamoles out of our country. You know, and it's just, it's just that type of stuff that these guys, that's all they care about. And they, care what, so the tax rate in this state is this, but they don't talk about that. They talk about hatred. Is the hunting parties are true? Yes. Oh, yeah. Wow. 100%. You know, that's what just sickened me. And when I so said this is not just movies and extremists. Oh, no, no. What I, I you know, I haven't seen the truth in movies about what's really going on. I, I, I uh, there's two types of hunting trips. The, the skins do the hunting trip where they get in the car, they drive through neighborhoods looking for minorities. Then they'll jump out of the car and then they'll just beat the living crap near death or actually kill people. Get back in their car, drive away and look for another one. That's a hunting trip. Then there's a hunting trips where they go down to the border and they sit up on the side of the mountains. And, and you, you haven't if you haven't been to the Arizona border, it's, it is wide open. There's a two string, a two strand um, fence that that is all there is. So they sit up there and they wait for them to come across. And from across one goalie to another, they shoot odd six, two, two, threes, AKs, and they kill these guys. Documented. Wow. And how is the relationship between the different extremist groups like the Proud Boys, the KKK? Is like, are they like competing to who's the most hated person, or is there, or they like work together in a way? Like, what's the difference between like, oh, I'll join that. It's like colleges, like I'll join this. No, I'll join this. Like, what is what's the difference? But I, I feel that's so crazy. Is because like on Tuesday they were best friends, and by Saturday, if you weren't keeping up on it, they were infighting. So, it, I mean, it maybe wasn't quite that quick, but I, I used to say the white supremacist world changes every 15 minutes. With, if you don't stay up on it, you don't, it's it's like your best soap opera. There's definitely a pecking order between groups that you join. Like like the National Alliance was the, the, the best organization to join. Then you go down from there, then it'd be like Voltron, then Vinland. Then best Hammer. in terms of what? That like the, the most, the most notable Oh, God, I, I feel sorry next. for the bigot that gets rejected from the top well, white supremacist organization. Well, that Timothy much of a loser it. that the other bigots won't accept you? Yeah, Timothy McVeigh got kicked out of the National Alliance because he was too too violent. His tendencies were too violent. So you got the alliance and you go down at the bottom of the rung is the Klan. The Klan within the, the white supremacy movement is a joke. They're a bunch of idiot, backwoods idiots. And you to know? join one of these groups, how do you like... What do you have to prove? What do you have to do? Is there a test that there's a, you know, what what do you what do you do to be accepted? Well, do you, to, to become to become a member of some of the organizations, there is a there, one of them you had to do a book report on your your lineage. So you had to research who you are, where you came from, and prove that you were white. After you did that, you get your white your white shoelaces or your white laces that prove white power. Then if you want to earn your reds, you have to go drive around again a hunting trip, and they point out a minority that you have to go assault and beat down to draw blood and then they give you your red laces to put in your boots and then from there once you become a laced up member then you can move on to whatever you know you could be the the notable beer guy okay well john's gonna bring the beer you know or 
or the leadership is always the guy who's the most eloquent in his speech, maybe, or the most violent that they respect or they're scared of. So, you know, in your local crews, it's just a bunch of dudes that hate everybody and they'll beat people down in your national crews is all, yeah, you have to be assigned leadership roles and probates and, and probates. Uh, hot tub. I have to go. I'm sorry. But I just want to say uh, that stat I said about the immigrants and the birth, I'm not sure it's 100% correct. I, I'm always paranoid. I'm not sure if it was illegal immigration or just immigration. And I'm always paranoid about uh, poisoning the bloodstream of America with disinformation. So, uh, you know, just uh, take that. There, there was something like that. I saw it in the news, but I, I may well, not have gotten yeah. exactly right. Um, whatever it is, it's a huge number. Uh, uh, but you know how I, I, I don't want to ever have to correct myself. So I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. I, forgive me. I have to go. Something came up. It's nice meeting you. Um, good to see you. Bye, Happy bye, New Year. Bye, bye. Take care. Uh, uh, so for, you know, social media like uh, Twitter or X now or, you know, uh, you, you know, um, Facebook, all this stuff, like how much, like how did that, did that help more or less in creating more hate? Because I feel in one way, people can just get their hate out in terms of talking and not doing anything, which is bad, but, you know, not as bad as actually acting on it. And in another way, you know, this could be promoted to somebody can read this and become motivated and do something crazy. So what's your, what's your thoughts on social media and uh, rise of like hate crimes and all that? I think social media is causing a lot of hate to be, to be distributed and to be out. I mean, it used to be where you had to get your literature in the mail from these people and now you can go online and get whatever you want. You can go down the rabbit hole of, of whatever topic you want to go down. And within two hours, you're talking to people in Europe about how much, you know, this party or that party or this race or that race is hated. And then you're getting this online indoctrination. I don't think, a, 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 and I'll use the term keyboard Nazi. I don't think a keyboard Nazi can stay keyboard for that long. I think they're going to go out and commit a crime and, and commit assaults because it's stuck in their head. And when you go to bed hating at night, you wake up hating in the morning and then you hate all day long and then you go to bed and you're still hating. And when you consume yourself and trust me, I learned firsthand that when you consume yourself with this stuff, it it will take over. It will take over. And luckily, like Tani talked about earlier, you know, that detox time was so important because I had to get it out. Um, but. Social media is horrible when it comes to this. Stuff. Well, and I think that it's for me, it's frightening for our children because you can be indoctrinated pretty quickly and you can find whatever you want to find. And um, but it was like that. It's been like that for a very long time. I just think it's be, it's been tur turbocharged with, you know, some of the new platforms. But it was it's been like that. It was you were online getting indoctrinated, getting all your stuff in the very beginning as well. Yeah. I mean, I was a Black Panther online. <laughs> I was a member really? of the Black, I was a member of the new Black Panther Party online huh. because we had a group moving in the Mesa. My chief asked me to find out what I could. So I became a member of the new Black Panther Party. I tried to go to the first meeting and it didn't go over very well. So that was the end of my undercover career in that. <laughs> so it, but whatever you want online, you will find. Yeah. Out of curiosity, with with Black Panthers, are they black supremacists or are they black separatists? Or like does it I, I'm not I'm not terribly familiar with that organization. All the above. All of the above. You know, um, the, the crazy thing is I met a guy and he and I told this to Matt and he thought it was kind of crazy. But he said, if you really want to know what a white supremacist is, watch Malcolm X. And Matt thought that that was going to be ridiculous. And we watched it. And it, he said, he's right. Mm. You know, the two the two ideologies really do mesh and um, intertwine. Yeah, big time. Uh, I think a lot of them, if you take. Not only like with black and white, but everything. If you take the names, it's the same ideology, the same speech, the same way of everything. Um, what do you what do you think the solution is like for all this hate? I know it's a big, big question. Nobody, you know, but from you being in the middle of it, what's the solution is like it's like it's not education because I think a lot of people are educated. It's just like the information like before it used to be you research for the information then you form your opinion now you form your opinion first and then you look for information to support it and you're going to find it because there's always somebody crazy saying something so what's the solution in your opinion well i i do think education is part of the solution i i think that um 
I, I think that the the solution is is just like we're a big football family. We have two kids that play college football. We love football in our home. We we watch it. And our son was in high school football last year, and the coach brought the whole team together in preseason and says, you know, puts them in a room and says, everybody's going to know everybody in this in this room. What you've been through, what you've seen, what you experienced, how your family life is, because we're going to build a brotherhood. There's black kids, white kids, Mexican kids, Jewish kids. Um, Catholic kids. There's a guy from family came from the Middle East. There's a guy whose family came from Ukraine. All these different demographics came together. And socioeconomic as well. I mean, very diverse. Mm -hmm. And they came together and they won state. They took the state title because they came together and understood each other. As mm. a family. And, you know, our son explains it that there were tears, you know, and he just had no idea some of the things these kids had been through. And they had no idea what he had been through. And they really, they really did grow to love each other. And I, I said, well, you just learned today the difference between hate and love. You know, love. There's complete opposites. But they came together. They came together and they worked together and they grew together and they conquered together. And that's what we need to do. We need this. This whole garbage going on with politics is dividing the country. It, it's that stuff's got to stop. You know, when and, and there, well, I can't even work with my colleagues across the aisle. Basically, you're saying these morons on the other side of the of the row here won't talk to us. You got to stop the name calling. You got to stop all that stuff. But then you got to get to the kids and it's a community problem. We have to deal with the communities before I take it globally like I want to. We have to talk to the community leadership, community policymakers, community church leaders, and, and really get involved with these kids' lives. Well, and, you know, these kids took state, they came together as a family. And it, my feeling was if we can, if he can do it at a high school level with a football team, you know, why can't we take that a little bit bigger? And just before we came to this podcast, we were meeting with one of the guys that's um, running for mayor because we want to put what we're saying and actually put it into action. And we talked about maybe doing a community project and bring, bringing us together. Just but to that experience and that experiment with your you know, son's uh, mm -hmm. college team, if it wasn't for say the coach, if, if he was a different kind of thinking, if you have a different kind of thinking, it wouldn't work, you know? So, you know, that's, you know, these are the people that need to be involved, you know, especially with the younger generations, yeah. you know? Yeah, we talk about that in the book, or coaches or teachers or religious leaders. All these people are so important in stopping the rise in hate. Hate, hate is an opposite of love. So there, there's probably most likely going to always be hate in this world. I mean, it's a choice people make. Just like there's hot water and cold water, there's love, there's hate. But we can stop the rise. We can stop the violence. We can stop all these different things that are bringing destruction. There is no happiness in hate. There just isn't. And when we're talking about this, there's something that we can all can do, you know, that kid that maybe is not being able, we're not able as much as parents to influence him at home. Well, a teacher can influence them. Give that kid a paintbrush, give that kid a lacrosse stick. You know, let's give them something where they feel like they belong before they search for the hate because the hate is right there. You know, yeah. let's give something that fills that gap of belonging. I, th I, I agree with you hundred percent. And I think like a lot of times uh, people need hate because it's escape, it's something to blame. But if we never, especially like we're talking about the younger generation now, if you n never give up on people, you know, and if they say not good at something, they fail on something, you do it another way, you still keep giving and giving and give. Just don't give up on them, you know, like keep keep being there for the, for different parts of the community. You know, I think it's going to, it could work, you know, we'll see. Andrew, you wanted to say something a couple of times. Or not? Um, I, I think you guys have hit a lot of what I was going to say. Um, uh, I, I'm curious as to what your biggest fear is. What, what is the the best probable case scenario from where we're at right now? And what is the worst probable case scenario that, that worries you? Well, for me, it's like love is the answer. And it's so simplistic and it makes everyone mad. But if someone cares about you and you don't give up, like you said, it really can make all the difference. And my my fear is that hate will win, that we'll let that take over and continue this divide that we keep seeing everywhere it's in our families everywhere we can't even talk in our families you know this is silly let's yeah. not hate when we all can make a difference even in the smallest of ways yeah my my biggest fear is that uh mass shootings based upon race and religion will keep going on and that we have we'll have a, a leader that 
that it promotes it in, in his or her own way. Best case scenario is that mass shootings don't continue and people don't get to be hurt, but we can have conversations that I can go up and talk to, knock on the door of a synagogue and have a conversation. Yeah. You know, that's that's my best case scenario. And I think that's what should happen. It, and and not believe what my uncle say, tell me about the Jews, you know? Yeah. And I know I we can all be proactive in our own way. There really is, if you look inside, there's something you know that you are uniquely capable of doing. You guys are doing it right now yeah. by talking to us. You know, yeah, that's that's what we tried to do the whole time. But you know, the sad part is like when I, you know, when I first saw, you know, the book, you know, and it's this is sad, is like the title in this world now could be anywhere, you know. And that's why we need more of like, you know, and I respect it when like I rather talk to you that like rather than talk to politicians, because politicians they fear about every word, they fear about everything, they they want to win election. You were there in the middle of it all, you saw it. I think you have more experience than a lot of people. So, and I think like people should be listening and reading stuff like that. Uh, I have a final question is, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of people, uh, maybe two questions, one about PTSD. And the other one is, I know a lot of people that either were involved in uh, undercover, um, you know, operations or, uh, you know, missions like that. And their family wasn't as tight, like, it destroyed their family pretty much, you know? So how did you guys manage? I know one of the things that you did is writing this book together, but but how how did you manage throughout this whole time uh, to, to continue having this relationship and uh, manage to survive it? Well, I'll, I'll speak for me is that I, I mean, I, I couldn't do anything in my career without Tani. That's not, not that Tani had to be there or Tani, yeah. but, but I, I couldn't do anything in my career because um, I could come home and and I didn't pick up a, a shot of Jack Daniels or make a rum and Coke or have a beer, but I would come home and Tony and I would talk. We, we would, when I was, when I was, when I was not at work, I was still at work and Tony was able to take me away from that and just say, Hey, you know what? You're safe. You're here. You don't have to worry about a show that's going on in California right now or a meeting going on somewhere else. You just be here and be present with us, your family. And and that's what saved me. A lot of undercover guys, they don't let that happen. You know, they go home. You forget the undercover guys. A lot of cops, a lot of military, they they don't let that happen. And they go straight to an addiction or, or straight to whatever it is. And they step away from the things that really are most important. And Tani was most important to me. And and that's why I'm alive. And I can tell you firsthand, without a doubt, the reason why I'm still alive is because Tani was able to help me and coach me and walk me through all that stuff. We were just kids. I mean, we were just kids. So I just knew that when he became the monster that I was not liking what I saw, you know, I could tell him and in to his credit, you know, people, he always says I was so lucky to have Tani. I was lucky to have a guy that actually listened to some of that and could see, hey, she cares about me. And she's saying this is happening and he cared enough to make those changes and to listen. I think it's very hard when you, you know, wars in general and all that is hard, but I feel like, you know, I don't think that somebody have it worse than the other. I think every individual have it, you know, their own experience. But I feel like a lot of times when you're at war and then you, you travel back home away from the whole thing versus this is, your home this is your people this is your neighborhood this is your life this is your city it's it must be very hard you know because they're not the enemy but they are you know are you, are you relating that back to the ptsd side of things yeah here's here's the thing about um about me is that i my undercover career took me all over the valley i grew up in phoenix i knew phoenix like the back of my hand I worked with the Mesa PD, but I, I worked all around the valley in the state. And I don't think there's any part of this valley that doesn't have a memory of an incident or a an arrest or a murder or or whatever it might be. And and that's why recognizing the the triggers and the signs and, and the things that happen with PTSD is so important. And but that's also having Tani to, to say, oh shoot. Do you want to go here? Because I know in going to this location, we're going to go through different neighborhoods that you talk about or that that things have happened. Um, you know, like even going to the grocery store at times, you see people 
that is like, hey, Tani, we need to go. I, you know, I, I got to tell you that that's one of the reasons for me that I wanted to write the book because I really didn't want to mm. um, is because I wanted law enforcement families to know they weren't alone. That, you know, what we what I thought we were going through, I thought we were doing it alone and come to find out, you know, this is happening all over the place. And I think one of the good things about the book, too, is like, you know, a lot of people is like, oh, there's a lot of white supremacy. What, what are we doing about it? And they don't know, you know, the heroic of, you know, the people on the front line, you know, so I think it's uh, it's uh, important. Yeah, I'm glad Andrew, you asked because cops aren't robots, you know, they're not wired to do this either. And so it, it's like, you know, I want to say hug your cop friend, too. And and even though I know there's corruption and Matt's all against that and that's in the book as well, you know, these are for the most part, good dudes, good women that are, that want to make a difference in their community. Yeah, and I'm tired of cops committing suicide. There's over 150 suicides last year alone of police officers. And, and it's all because of PTSD and or just choices and decisions they make in their lives and careers that they think that they can't go on anymore. That that stuff needs to stop. Yeah. And, and it only stops by bringing awareness and bringing support and it's like Tony, I'm not. We're not telling you. Hey, it's hug a cop day. No, because cops don't want to be hugged by you to start with. But yeah. what we what we do want and what we do like is somebody to say, "Hey, thanks for what you do." Yeah, you know, just simple little things. If I pull you over because you're speeding, don't flip me off and tell me to go to hell for pulling you over. It's yeah. your fault that I pulled you over. I got, I got a nice story real quick. It, it wasn't a cop. It was a forest ranger. I love I love camping in national forests. Mm -hmm. And I was in <laughs> Mount Tamalpais, Pius, Mount Tamalpais up in Northern California, gorgeous. And I was driving around uh, in these redwoods and it was getting dark. And I was like, ah, I know I'm not supposed to sleep here. You're not supposed to sleep in this particular park, but I'm not used to, I'm from Oklahoma. It's dead flat. I don't know how to navigate hills. I'm just going to sleep here. I'll get up early. I'll leave the following day. No one will know. And I don't rise early. I woke up at like seven and a park ranger got there by like 730 and was like, did you sleep here? And I was like, nope, 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 nope. And then they came over, put their hand on the hood and were like, cold as a brick. We're lying. And I was like, oh, I'm really sorry. And she was like really nice. She was like, all right, here's what I, what's going to happen. I'm going to call your name in. And uh, if you do this again, you're going to get in trouble. You have a warning right now. You're OK. There's no legal trouble. But this is for your own protection. Here's why you shouldn't do this. Uh, went through the whole thing. And I ended up driving to the uh, um, the park ranger headquarters later to be like, hey, I got in trouble with this lady. She did a great job. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm really impressed with the forest rangers. I think my tax dollars are going to work. And like, that's the exact kind of person that I want dealing with a person like me. And they thought I was like making fun of her. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, I like I more than anybody can tell you she's doing a good job because I'm the guy that she got mad at. But she did it right. in a really like professional, decent way. So like, kudos to her, please. Guy that got in trouble has given a commendation to this person yeah it's 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 i wish that would happen more yeah when, when i when i was out it i got 19 17 ia complaints overnight and i went my whole career with none but it was all because i exposed these guys and so you know don't blame me for your stupidity yeah i think you know there's a bad apples obviously and everywhere but you know do, do you did you have a like after the undercover, because I know Tanya was there, but did you have help? Did they assign, you know, a therapist or anything to you afterwards or no? Because I think that's an important part that, you know, for undercover people that they should, you know, just they give you the assignment, they should follow up, make sure your mental health, because what if you don't have Tanya? What if you don't have a family? What do you do? Then, then you become an alcoholic. Or yeah. Maybe. Or you find your own therapy, you know, hopefully you're smart enough to take charge of your own mental health. That just... But it, it, but I think that's on them as well. They supposed to support, uh, you know, and take care of you. But here's the problem: admitting that you have a mental condition or or having, you know, nightmares or triggers or struggling, is admitting that you have a fault. Admitting that you have a problem, and and that's the problem with law enforcement: is you 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 go into law enforcement and you have to be bigger, better, stronger than the guy you're going up against. And and so a lot of cops won't even accept the fact that, you know what, you might have PTSD, dude, or yeah. you might have a problem here. And that was my problem is that I didn't I didn't want to admit the fact that I had a problem. And it that's luckily, gratefully, Tani was able to say, dude, you have a problem and we're going to get you help because the city wasn't going to help you. And I was so worried about losing my job. And Tani said, no, nah, you're done and we're going to get you help.
Well, I, we can talk for hours. I think this is, uh, you know, very, very interesting. And thank you for everything that you did. But if you want to hear more, you should get the book, you know, uh, The Hit Next Door right here. And uh, if you want to share anything that you guys want to promote or anything or people want to, if you want people to follow you uh, online or social media, you can go ahead. Yeah, you can find us at uh, Matt and Tawny at, yeah, it's M-A-T-T-N-T-A-W-N-I dot com. You can find us there. And I, my show, we have our show. Matt's doing a lot of investigating secrets of polygamy Monday nights on A&E. Check there it out. Go. And I, I guess I just want to say love each other. Just keep loving each other. I mean, that that really is the answer. And that, that show is very interesting. I think we might do another episode just about the show, too, because, uh, you know, I think. Oh, that's yes. True. I that's... Yes, you should. And Matt's been working a lot with trying to find, you know, missing children. Some of the things that. Yeah. It's been crazy what, what we've come up against. So, um, yeah, that's... that's that's crazy. Andrew, uh, what you got going on? Uh, you can always find me on the Political Orphanage. That is the podcast that I host. Um, for people that particularly enjoy this conversation, if you go to mightyheaton.com slash best of, it has the top 10 all-time episodes of the program on there, one of which is with Daryl Davis that we were discussing earlier. So that would, I think, be a good corollary to this episode of talking to the Black jazz musician who befriends KKK members and, and de-radicalizes them. And you can find that at mightyheaton.com slash best of. Definitely. Yeah. And um, Comedy Cellar, if you're in New York, come and visit us at the Comedy Cellar, best shows. And you can email us at Life America at Comedy Cellar. Guys, thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you for everything they've done. And when you come to New York, come and visit, please. I'll come to see you. I would love that.